Perfect. Did you guys each want to give a little sort of two minute introduction to yourself, who you are and your why? And I'll hand over to Dia. Hi everyone, good morning. It was so great to have everyone here this morning. Um, we have a very exciting session for you um, called Finding Your Why and it's why, why you would want to enter a career in healthcare. We have three amazing speakers with us this morning. Firstly, starting off with Dinesh, who is um, joining us all the way from Australia. Um, Dinesh was um, the first quadriplegic intern in Queensland and is the second person to graduate medical school with quadriplegia in Australia. Um, he's a doctor, a lawyer, a disability advocate, and a researcher. Halfway through medical school, Dinesh was involved in a motor vehicle accident that caused a cervical spinal cord injury. He is now completed an advanced clerkship in radiology at Harvard University. And as a result of his experiences, Dinesh has been an advocate for inclusivity and he is one of the founding members of Doctors with Disabilities Australia. Dinesh works in the emergency department at the Gold Coast University Hospital. He's a senior lecturer at Griffith University and adjunct researcher at Menzies Health Institute of Queensland. He's a researcher in spinal cord injury. He is a doctor for Gold Coast Titans Physical Disability Rugby Team and a senior advisor to the Disability Royal Commission. Dinesh was the Gold Coast hospital and health service junior doctor year of the year in 2018 he was awarded the medal of order in australia in 2019 and he was the third australian to be awarded a henry viscard achievement award um and he was the queensland australian of the year in 2021 so welcome Dinesh. it's lovely to have you here this morning great thanks for having me and next we have uh, David Wilson. For the past six years, um, Director of Recruitment and Admissions um, and Chair of Admission Groups at uh, Cardiff Met University. He has been involved in the selection of medical schools for many years and is a part of Medical School Council Selection Alliance, as well as the UK CAT Research and Development Team. He's taught in many medical schools for almost 40 years and is a profession, professor of medical education. Prior to uh, his time at Cardiff, he was head of anatomy and director in, of the division of biomedical sciences at the medical school in Queen's University of Belfast. So welcome, David. It's lovely to have you here this morning as well. And last but not least, we have Tista who is what, who co-leads the outreach team at the GMC and heads up uh, a welcome to UK practice to support doctors who qualified overseas. Besides many leadership responsibilities, Tister's role involves engaging with doctors, systems, system partners, and developing workshops on ethical standards. Prior to joining the GMC, Tissa spent many years in stakeholder management and worked with survivors of abuse, particularly in children's and mental health support services. More recently, she has worked on collaborative projects with Gold Standard Frameworks, Marie Curie and RCPG. Tista still provides support to survivors of abuse and is involved in collaborative projects to empower women and children. Good morning, Tista. Tista, it's lovely to have you here. So if I let our speakers start off, um, Tista, if you would be happy to start us off um, about the session, and I'm sure everyone is excited to um, say, see what you have to say today and then just move across our speakers. Thank you so much and morning, everyone. Um, so finding your why, uh, I guess my journey into healthcare started very much in the voluntary sector, supporting survivors of abuse in college and then more formally whilst I was at uni. I began counselling young survivors through our SARCs, our sexual assault referral centres, and became really, really interested in how system partners work together because I could see the impact that this was having on survivors. So sometimes our partners work really, really well, and other times not at all. And 
my character is uh, very much a fixer by nature, if you will. I see problems and I want to solve them. And I saw how hard colleagues worked in this incre increasingly challenging system that we have. And I was horrified by the impact, as I say, that poor join up and poor understanding had on survivors of abuse. And so began my journey into healthcare systems and medical ethics. And that was now, oh, nearly 25 years ago. So um, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's been a, a little while. And since then, I've worked to improve uh, various pathways, end of life care pathways that Dia briefly mentioned, child protection pathways, as you would expect. And just over 10 years ago, I um, was asked to join the GMC to help set up an outreach service to support doctors and intern patients on the ground. And um, I still work with survivors now of domestic abuse as well as of sexual assault. And I think having both those roles, it gives me a really good opportunity to hear and see what happens in reality to understand the pressures that we are all under, to understand the inequalities that we face and have both a direct impact with survivors that I work with, but I can also work to affect cultural change within our services. So I really value having that sort of two track approach. Um, so yes, that's a little bit about my why and a little bit uh, uh, about the journey I've taken. that I work with, but I can also work to affect cultural change within our services. So I really value having that sort of two-track approach. Um, Amazing. Yes, Thank you, Sister, so much. Um, David, if we could hear a few words from you. Yeah, well, I'll keep it brief because I feel somewhat uh, in awe of the two <laughs> previous speakers, uh, Sister and Dinesh. Uh, they've clearly done far more than I have done. I've always wanted to be a teacher. So my why has always been about researching and teaching and selecting, if you like, the next generation of medical students. So that's really all I can contribute this morning is the fact that I spend a lot of time you know, investigating students' desires to follow a particular path. And you know, it's almost entirely been medicine. And so therefore, that's been my focus. And what we try and do is understand rather than just them doing it because they think it's going to be glamorous or because it's going to be well paid or it's going to be you know something their mum and dad wants to, them to do it's to try and get down beneath that and find out what it is exactly that's motivating them so my why is more about trying to understand why other people want to do it it's sort of vicarious if you see what i mean <laughs> probably not completely legitimate but it is what we have to do because as I come, well, I come to explain in the talk later, the important thing these days is to try and get students who are both academically able, but also have the personality and the desire to follow the career that they're aspiring to. So I'll keep it short because there's a bit of a, a follow on from me. And I, as I say, I'm in much more august company. Uh, so I'll let them do the talking. Okay, thank you. Also has a personality and the desire to follow the career that they're aspiring to. So I'll keep it short because it's a bit of a great. Thank you, David. And finally, Dinesh, if we could hear from you. All right. Thanks a lot for uh, having me this morning. Uh, well, it's evening for us here in Australia. But um, I think the why is really, really important before I go into my why. I, I think it's important to just remember that the why is important for us, no matter what we do, whether it's healthcare or otherwise. Healthcare in particular, um, when I work as a doctor in the emergency department, it's a challenging profession from medical school all the way through to training until when you're fully trained um, there are a lot of challenges that you come across. 
you can be sleep deprived, you got to study, you got to deal with patients, you got to deal with difficult situations. And to deal with all those challenges, it's not enough um, to just do it for the sake of it. You really need a reason and a purpose. And uh, I'm lucky to have found that. My journey into medicine wasn't really that straightforward. I never grew up wanting to be a doctor. I grew up having all these different ideas about what I wanted to do with my life. But when I graduated, I decided to go to law school. And that's when uh, that's where I did my first degree. But when I was in law school, I realized that uh, I didn't really have a why. And as time went on, I started to become depressed. My mood started to get flatter and flatter, and I started to feel lower and lower. I started to develop anxiety, and it got so bad to the point where I was getting panic attacks every time I went outside the house. So I became too afraid to go outside the house. And there's a big biological component to depression, but I think they're also turning points in our lives. Sometimes these things are a sort of a orange light to make us think about what we're doing and how we're living. And I think that's what it was for me. And so I started thinking about how I wanted to spend my life and what I wanted to do. And one thing that really resonates with me is something that my mom likes to say, and that is, by helping one person, you mightn't change the world, but you'll change the world for them. And as I started emerging from the depression, I realized that my own world had changed. I was engaging in the community again, I was going out, I was productive, and I was doing all these things. So my entire world started to change. And I thought, what if I could do this for someone? What if I could play a small part in changing someone's world? And that was an idea that really, really resonated with me. And um, that and Grey's Anatomy was why I decided to become a doctor. So, <laughs> I wasn't really great as an admin, but um, that, uh, that really spurred me on and I finished law school and studied medicine and uh, it was the best choice I ever made. I knew that I'd found my purpose and my why. Um, and halfway through medical school, I had a spinal cord injury after a motor vehicle accident. So it changed my life again. But, you know, I knew that um, I was on the right path because even after the accident and even after all the challenges that came with it, I still wanted to be a doctor. So I worked through it um, and this is my fifth year as a doctor now. And uh, it's the best job in the world. And every single day uh, I get to change someone's world, hopefully, or at least play a small part in it. And um, it's awesome. I really love it. So I think no matter what we do, it doesn't matter what it is, having our why helps us wake up in the morning and it energizes us. And um, I really encourage everyone here to think about that. Thank you, Dinesh. Um, it was it's so inspiring to hear your story and all of our speakers are so inspiring and that is exactly what this session was meant for it's to bring stories and real people into health careers and show our aspiring health career students why and what strength they need to pull within themselves to be able to get them started on a career um, in, in any healthcare field. Um, I would like to turn to our audience and ask, uh, see if they have any questions, if you can send it to me on the stage chat and I can bring it to our speakers um, and let them take it from there.
while while the questions are coming in, Tista, if I could um, just ask you, um, you've w worked with so many people who have survived so many tragic um, experiences in their life. Mm -hmm. And if you had any advice to give uh, to any of our aspiring students who find that they might not find their way into a career in healthcare and feel demotivated at, at times because of their circumstances or because of their experiences, is there anything you could tell them and how they can challenge, challenge, channel their motivation? Yes, absolutely. I think that is such an important point um, when you are, as you say, working with uh, patients, clients, as, as we call them in the service, uh, who have been through such difficulty. And it's really important that you can put yourself in a place where you reflect rather than ruminate and there is a very distinct difference between the two uh, and I certainly used to ruminate but um, I worked with other colleagues, other experienced colleagues to learn how to, as you say um, very wisely, channel that into reflection and in fact I'm going to be talking about reflection later on today uh, and in Fact, my my experiences that my, my first one of my first experiences that still stays with me today from all those years ago was shattering for me absolutely shattering but it's through learning how to properly reflect so that you're learning and um, as I say in terms of my personality I want to fix things so I learned how to channel that into improvement and helping and compartmentalize as well so it is hugely important you don't isolate yourself and um, find a way that works for you to turn rumination into reflection thank you Tista um, we have another question and David uh, uh, sorry Dinesh if I could um, give that to you. We have a aspiring student asking, what would be one tip you would give to your past self during your medical school application process? Yeah, that's a great question. I really want, I want, I want to get into medical school so badly, like when I, when I found out. And to be honest, if I could go back, I'd probably tell myself to um, just keep following the dream. Um, I basically did every single thing I could, you know, for the um, entrance exam, I found every single past paper, every question, I studied um, every little morsel of um, information that I could find about it. I practiced and practiced and practiced for the interview. Um, I found every little bit for the application I can. So um, I think, you know, I, um, was talking to someone about, because uh, it's, it's, it's a competitive process, right? And you see medical students that want to get into medical school um, and you see a whole spectrum of them. But um, you, you basically have to do everything that you can to try and compete with other people that are applying. You know, one of the examples about um, performance that all often comes up is that Usain Bolt set the 100 meter record by something like 0 0.002 of a second for the guy that came before him and that's all it was. It's a really fine margin of error. So if you really, really want to get into uh, medical school, I think you just have to try and get every single advantage that you can as long as you make sure there's a why behind why you're doing it. Great. Um, we just for everyone wondering, we are um, David has we've had some slight difficulties, but he is joining us back as soon as possible. Um, but continuing on with your uh, with our session, um, so we have a very interesting question here, which could um, I think could be very useful for everyone, and it is a student asking about looking back on your career. Do you feel as though it was worth it and 
what all the difficulties and um, the your journey uh, and how 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 does one measure that and how do, do you know that it, it's worth it in the end? Tissa, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, um, I guess my immediate thought is that I love what I do and I still love what I do. I get immense personal value from it and I speak with um, uh, some friends and family who um, see their career as a job. I don't see mine as a job. Uh, my son occasionally whinges to me about that, but I, I am so passionate about what I do. I, I am um, still enthused and fired up. So, it, it, so the journey, if you will, was it worth it? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, um, you know, I think, like Tista said, you've got to love what you do, and I'm the same. Like, I, there hasn't been one moment where I didn't think that medicine wasn't for me, and that's, um, or, and there wasn't one moment where I thought about leaving it or giving it up, and that's just because I've loved what I do, and therefore it makes it worthwhile. I was chatting to a performance coach that, um, coaches some Formula One champions and motocross riders and all these other people. And uh, I'm a doctor for a um, rugby team, a national one. And you know, the, you can see, we, we, we had a coffee the other day, and you can see the athletes that love what they do. There's a difference. They're, they're the ones that do it for the paycheck, and they're the ones that do it for the love of it. And the paycheck players never last because there's, there's no solid reason, but the ones that do it for the love of it last. And there, there are um, people that you can see around the world that are just lasting because they love what they do and they get through any hardship because of that. Um, so I think um, if at the core of you, you love what you do, then anything becomes worthwhile. Um, absolutely, and thank you guys so much for such wise opinions. Um, another uh, question for Tista actually is, um, someone had asked, what would you say are the benefits of carrying out voluntary work? Um, it's, oh, there are so many benefits, so many benefits. I think it broadens your horizons. Uh, that That's a clear one for me. And for example, I didn't do much work, work in domestic abuse. I formerly work with survivors of sexual abuse, but I now um, volunteer in domestic abuse as well. And for me, it, it, that has opened my eyes to a, a, an area that I had less knowledge about and it's giving me, again, going back to what we would, um, Dinesh and I were just talking about in terms of loving what you do and things being worthwhile, it's worthwhile because it makes a difference to me. So uh, voluntary work can give you that. Um, it can, um, thinking of our um, audience today, uh, as you think of your future careers ahead, it can give you um, that, that added value, experience, and, um, uh, and sense, yeah, sense of um, worth as well, I suppose, that you are contributing and making a difference in addition to um, more formal work that you do. If I could add a point to that too, um... I think we're at a time in society where we are so inward looking. It's, you know, it's about how many followers we have on social media or how, we, how many likes we have or what we can get or the big house or the new bag or whatever. And we look inwards and we are, we are actually, I, I was um, at a talk recently and they were talking about short term memory long-term memory. And they're saying that short-term working memory has a limited capacity, but 
the long-term memories are thought to be infinite, almost, to a certain extent. So we're actually infinite beings inside. If we're look, looking to fill ourselves constantly, it's a never-ending journey that doesn't lead to happiness. But if we look at giving, and if we look at what we can do for society, and we, what we can do for the people around us, and what we can do to make this world better, that actually leads to true happiness, because you're looking outwards. There's nothing that you need, but you're giving yourself to the world, and that's what volunteering is all about. Volunteering can uh, give you a sense of happiness that you can't really get from doing other things, and I think that's probably the most crucial part of that. Um, great. Uh, Dinesh, we have a question that we, I think that you might be able to answer and it's about how it was like going, undergoing another degree and I'm, I'm sure that amongst us we have um, graduates who want to pursue medicine as a career and want to uh, do medicine as a uh, mature student. So what was your experience like and um, what advice would you have for, for our aspiring healthcare students in that category? Coming from a, a non-medical, non-science degree into medicine was a bit of a transition because a lot of people that started medicine with me uh, came from science degrees or biomedical science degrees or um, all sorts of things. So the first few months or at least the first six months was really challenging because um, they were learned what a cell is and what's inside it and how some of the basic things work, but I had to remind myself. Um, so it was a bit challenging coming from a law degree into medicine, but after a period of time, particularly after the first and second year, things just even out and um, it's it becomes an even playing field again. But um, I think again, you know, if, if you're going to do something for eight to 12 hours a day or more, sometimes, if you're a doctor, um, you gotta do what you, you like. So um, I knew that I didn't wanna be a lawyer. I knew that I didn't really enjoy it. Um, and so coming into medicine was okay. And a lot of people make transitions like that. You know, I um, recently talked to a nurse who's in her 30s, she's got kids, um, she's a mum, and she has to work to support the family, but she really wanted to become a doctor, so she's in medical school. She gets up at like 2 or 3 a.m. to study most days, and she juggles her kids, work full-time. But the transition has been worthwhile for her, so um, if you're coming from another degree, I think um, if you really want to do it, it's worthwhile. Absolutely. And it is about really, as you guys said earlier, it's really about chasing your dreams. And it's um, the work that everyone has to put in, regardless of what your background is. Um, Tissa, we have a question for you. And it's, what should all healthcare professionals learn, know, learn or be taught about issues relating to abuse? And how should we approach this issue in um, education and beyond? I think we could spend a good deal more time on, um, uh, on this and I think that we need to start with survivor stories. Um, I, uh, we, I often see in, uh, in the health sort of formal healthcare sphere uh, language that is quite stigmatising language that uh, minimizes for example sexual violence and it's not intentional it's just the language that we end up using it's a language that is taught right from undergrad and people uh, unless they are working in these services like the SARCs you just use you just repeat what you hear don't you and uh, that can have a huge impact because language socializes us it makes us think differently. 
So I would start by ensuring that there is uh, some consistency across curricula. Clearly, there needs to be flexibility as well, but some consistency across curricula that introduces survivor stories and then um, and then takes it from there, really. I think shadowing, we do have some um, uh, students shadowing uh, in our services. It's a bit more challenging given the nature of um, uh, the, well, the abuse that, that uh, our clients suffer but it is very valuable and uh, it, it can be revelatory. I've seen students who have uh, not had the opportunity to think about it before and then been inspired. So um, yes, we do need to do a lot more around this, a, a very wise question. Great, thank you so, so much to the both of you. And I'm sure this session we could continue talking um, for a long, long time. But unfortunately, uh, we have to, we have come to the end of the time allotted. So if I can ask you both to leave us with some passing words um, and uh, to say I know that you're um, giving a, another session later in the conference and I'm sure that everyone will be very excited to join you for that. But um, for now, I firstly want to thank both of you so much for starting us off. We've had a wonderful session to kick off the conference. And if I could just ask you to say a few words to um, our audience and uh, uh, Dinesh, if I could ask you to go first. Yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, thanks for having me and it's been awesome sharing this little bit of time with you so far. But I think the um, core of uh, what this session was about is really, really important and that's the why. You, know, really, you really need to think about why you're pursuing this career and why you're pursuing anything in life if you're going to be spending time doing it because time ticks on and you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow and uh, you want to be able to look back at any moment and be happy with what you've done and what you're doing. So really think about your why um, and use that when you go forward. Thank you. I thought we had David back for a moment, but um, uh, Artista, I will let you go and hopefully be able to join us. Yeah, absolutely. I, I um, uh, couldn't agree more with what uh, Dinesh said there. A uh, couple of other thoughts for me. Um, I remember that I remember going to the inaugural Becoming a Doctor conference back in, I think it was 2017, and of course it would grow now to uh, the Health Careers Conference. But I remember that enthusiasm when I met um, attendees there face to face. And I, I remember thinking, this is brilliant. You are all going to go into healthcare, and I am so happy to see the diversity, the, um, uh, the excitement and, uh, you know, keep that with you. Um, I can't see you face to face today, unfortunately, we, we, we are where we are, but um, keep that with you. And a second thing for me, um, there are myriad opportunities. We talked about volunteering briefly before, um, use them. There are people who would be delighted to speak with you about their experiences and um, uh, and access that, have mentors, have coaches, informally as well as formally, and just access all that is available to you. So you've got your why, then shape your why, and, um, and, and welcome. It is great to have you here. Thank you both so, so much. And to say, I think we all can agree that we would have loved to be in person and love to see um, the two of you, um, and the three of you actually, um, David including, um, talk in person. But thank you so, so much for starting us off for what is going to be a wonderful two days. And uh, we hope that you stick around for the other sessions and you are welcome in the speakers lounge as well. But for now, thank you very, very much. And I uh, hope the rest of you guys enjoy the rest of the conference on all the sessions we have coming up.